Hello everyone and welcome to Cherry Avenue Christian Church Online for January 12th. Thanks for choosing to be with us today. And welcome back to our online service for those of you who have been meeting with us in person. Uh, I hate that we've needed to pause our in-person services for a couple of weeks, but I am grateful we have this as a way of staying connected. And hopefully we'll be able to meet together in person again very soon. Especially in light of today's message where we're going to look at the importance of community. I hope that you're participating in our churchwide time of prayer each Sunday morning at 930, where we're joining together in prayer even while we're apart. So we want to always be a people of prayer, a praying church, and this is one of the ways that we do that. Of course, we had planned to have youth groups starting back today, but we can't do that. We'll keep you posted on when that will resume. And the ladies' Bible study we started on Tuesdays at 5.30 p.m. is going to move to Zoom now, uh, at least for the next couple of weeks. So those of you who have been involved with that, Christy will be sending you the information so that you can join her there. And our online Bible study will be resuming next Tuesday. I, I hope you'll join us for that. If you need to get caught up, all the previous videos are online. You can watch them on our website as well as Facebook, YouTube, and Vimeo. And all of this serves as a reminder to get signed up for the notifications if you haven't already. You can get them by phone call or text or email. Just call the office and I'll get you set up. And I hope you're checking on people who aren't able to get these videos. So, And if so, please encourage them to sign up for the, the notifications so they can be kept informed. Now, as we come to our prayer time today, we have a huge praise. We've been praying for a while that our new senior minister, Steve, would find a place to live here in Charlottesville. And uh, he's put an offer on a house, and he has a house he can rent if things don't work with that. So he's planning on being here in February. So we, we want to thank God for that. That's a big answer to prayer. We want to lift up Lori R., who's been in the hospital this past week, and we want to, to lift her up to the Lord in prayer. And we have several people who are not feeling good right now and are self-quarantining out of caution. And a few people who've tested positive who we want to pray for. Uh, we don't believe that anybody has gotten it through contact here at the church, but we want to make sure we're as cautious as we can to keep people as safe as possible. And so we want to pray for all of our folks who are feeling bad, whether it's the normal winter stuff or something more. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for the many, many ways you blessed us. We thank you for the answered prayer with Steve's housing, and we pray that you'll work through his move as he joins us here, that you'll bless us, and that we might reach out with the gospel in this area in an even greater way. Lord, we lift up Lori, who's in the hospital, and pray that you would be with her. And we pray for all of those who are feeling bad with, with colds, that you would bless them through that. And Lord, for those who have covid we pray a special blessing that its effects would be minimal and that it would be confined effectively. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we serve, that we might bring glory to you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we're in week two of our Overflowing Life series. And after a time of worship, we're going to have part two, Overflowing Commitment. I search the world It couldn't fill me Man's empty praise Treasures and faith Are never enough You came along Put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Hey. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is.
you my weakness Failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all You still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better. You give beautiful ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways you're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing it like you mean it. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn When I was growing up, we moved a lot. Whether it was transfers from my dad's job or when he decided to pick up and go to Bible college at 31 or in different churches he served, we moved a lot. So I always felt like the new kid. And in some places, I fit in just fine from the get-go. I'd find guys with similar interests and we were cool. they were cool about welcoming the new guy and it was great. Some places I eventually fit in, but it took some time. In other places, I still didn't feel like I fit in even after a couple of years. The strange thing is that the place where I had the least in common with people and back in the boondocks of eastern North Carolina were some of the closest relationships I had. And in other places where we had more in common, I always felt like an outsider. In fact, when we lived in Harrisonburg, I was about 13, I remember my dad coming in one night and asking my brother and me what we thought of the idea of moving to Roanoke. And I said, I can have my bags packed in five minutes. Just give me, let me do it. I felt isolated and alone the whole time we were there. And when you're in junior high and you have to sit alone at the lunch table or you're in elementary school and you're playing alone on the playground at recess, it's not fun. And my guess is that everyone knows that feeling to one degree or another. We know the pain of loneliness. Maybe it's not being included on the playground or maybe it was having a group, not having a group to sit with at the lunch table or seeing on social media that some of your friends went out to dinner but nobody invited you. Maybe it's getting left out of a meeting you should have been included in at work, or being the one single person at a table full of couples. Mother Teresa said, the most devastating disease in the world today isn't leprosy or cancer, it's loneliness. She said, it's the feeling of being unwanted and uncared for, and it doesn't really have much to do with whether or not there are people around you. You can feel lonely in the middle of hundreds of people. Some of you know that feeling. It's not necessarily being alone that's so bad. It's feeling alone. 
And I think that's been exacerbated during COVID. So many people have been forced to stay in and they're alone. And for those who are tech savvy, they can be isolated without necessarily feeling alone because they can keep connected. But for those who aren't the technological kind, to be able to keep connected online or through video chats, it can be lonely when they can't do that. Loneliness isn't just an emotion. It takes a toll physically. I've read that loneliness increases the mortality rate about the same that smoking does. It can impair your immune function. It can boost inflammation. It can cause arthritis as well as other physical problems. And because of this, if you go back to the book of Genesis, you see God creates the world. And with every individual thing God creates, he speaks it into existence, and then he would look at it and say, it's good. God created the heavens and the earth, the light, the sky, the dry ground, and he saw that it was good. He created the trees and the plants, and he said, it's good. He created the seas and the animals, and it was good. I heard a comedian say one time, man invented an automobile and called it fantastic. God created a tree and said, it's good. Man did a refrigerator and said, amazing. God created a rabbit and said, it's good. The wheels fell off the car and the fridge broke down. The tree's still up and the rabbit's still running. Man says, awesome. God says, good. But when God creates man, when he created Adam, he let him work in the garden a while and he watched him. And at some point he looked at him and said, something's not right. The boy needs help. This thing of him being alone just isn't working. And so he said, it's not good for man to be alone. That's not what's best for him. And it was only after God created a woman to be with the man that he looked at human beings and said, it's good. So God, the architect and creator of life says, I didn't make you to be alone. Now that doesn't specifically mean marriage. Scripture's clear that there are advantages to being single. But he says, I created you for community. I created you to be in relationships with people, to share your life with others. It's not good for you to be alone. God says that we need each other. And so what we want to talk about this morning as we continue our Overflowing Life series is one of the distinctive things about the church. There's a special distinctive trait of the church that we have an uncommon togetherness, that we have a special commitment to one another, that we're not just coming together here on Sundays to build ourselves up personally, that you didn't just wake up this morning and turn this on or, you know, when before COVID that you woke up and came to church just to be entertained or to learn something new. There's more to it than that. We're here to be part of a community where we're here for each other. There are about 50 places in scripture that tell us to do for one another, that we're meant to be in a community where we're committed to each other, that the church should never be a lunchroom where people have to sit alone or a playground where people feel unwanted and uncared for. We were made for each other. And so in 1 Thessalonians 2, we're going to start in verse 17, but I want to give you a sneak preview of what I want you to recognize in this passage. As we walk through this passage, I want you to see the deep community based on a sincere commitment to each other. See, a lot of people want community, but they don't necessarily want the commitments. But you don't get community without making some commitments to someone else. And I've seen this a lot in Celebrate Recovery, where people will come to the large group, but they don't get into an open share group or, or they don't come to the, or maybe they come to the open share group, but they don't make an effort to share or get to know the others in the group. See, that takes commitment. The depth of community that you experience in life is directly connected to the depth of the commitments you're willing to make to the people around you. And when you're committed to others, then the likelihood of you feeling real community is going to be much higher. And that's what we're going to talk about and we're going to see here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, let me give you a reminder of the context here. The book of Acts tells us that, uh, that Paul had traveled to, through to Thessalonica with Silas. And what they would do is they would visit a local synagogue because visiting teachers were always welcome to come in and teach. And so they would preach about Jesus and teach that he was the Messiah. And a number of people listened to what they had to say and so he planted a church there in Thessalonica before the synagogue leaders chased him out after three weeks because they didn't want to hear him talk about Jesus. And he must have also found other places to talk to people because his church also had Gentiles in it. And it makes sense with Thessalonica being in Greece 
So this church has some Jews and a lot of Gentiles, two groups who had previously kept their distance from each other. But now they're coming together because of their common connection to Christ. And that just didn't sit well with the Jewish leaders in the city. And Acts 17 tells us that they were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the local marketplace to stir things up and start a riot. And they found out that Paul and Silas were staying at the house of a fellow named Jason. And so they go there, but Paul and Silas aren't there. So they arrest Jason and his family and tell them that if Paul and Silas show up again and preach about Jesus again, that they're going to hold Jason and his family responsible. And so what happens is these new Christians risked their lives to sneak Paul and Silas out of the city. And they went on to another city called Berea. And so Paul never really had a good chance to say goodbye to the church at Thessalonica like he wanted to. And part of what this letter uh, is uh, that, that we're reading is him getting to say some of the things that he didn't get a chance to say before he left there. He shows his commitment to them and his affection for them. And what we see in this letter is an example of what the church is supposed to be. And so in chapter 2, starting with verse 17, he says, Brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. So you see in his language here that he wants to reiterate that they're loved. And he wants them to understand that he's committed to them. He's not just leaving them in their, you know, to flail away in their new faith. Some people had come to them and had badmouthed Paul and said, hey, this guy left you high and dry. He abandoned you. He ran out on you. He doesn't really care about you. And Paul wants to address this head on and, and, and reassure them of how committed he is to them. And so he uses some strong emotional words because he wants them to realize the community is based on commitment and he's committed to them. Now, the problem in our culture is that we've gotten to the point that we measure relationships more by connection than commitment, right? I mean, more and more, we define friendships and relationships by connections rather than by commitment to people. But that doesn't cut it. You can have hundreds of friends on Facebook, but have no real relationships because relationships require commitments. Without that, we're going to feel lonely no matter how many followers or online friends we have. In 2008, about 10% of the U.S. population was on social media. Ten years later, in 2018, it was 80%. And it stayed pretty steady over the past couple of years. And that's all fine and good as far as it goes. Social media is like most things in life. It's good if it's used properly and it's destructive if not. Most things in life fall into that category. But what we're finding is that overuse of social media is creating less of a connection rather than more of a connection. According to a Wall Street Journal article in May of 2017, an increased use of social media actually increases feelings of isolation. Now that seems strange, doesn't it? You would think the more you use social media, the more connected you feel. But the research is indicating just the opposite of that. Is that strange? The, the more tools we have at our, our, our disposal to connect us, the lonelier and more isolated we feel. Sherry Turkle is a professor at MIT who's written a book that looks at this phenomenon and the research being done on it. And she says, we're always communicating, but we seldom have real conversations. And she uses this word picture. She says, it's like taking a sip of water. The social media use during the day. Every time you check your Facebook or Instagram or send a tweet, it's like taking a sip and it feels like you're drinking a lot of water. It feels like relationally you should be really hydrated, but you're not really drinking anything at all. It's just these little sips. It's not adding up to much at all. And it feels like we're drinking a lot, but we're not hydrated relationally speaking because we just take these small sips and it's not anything significant. She says, Social media offers the illusion of companionship without the demands of a relationship. The illusion of companionship without the demands of a relationship. And that sounds pretty appealing for some of us, doesn't it? All the benefits without any of the cost. Sign me up for that in most things, right? But she says the issue is that it's not real. It's the illusion of companionship. Because it doesn't require any of the demands of a relationship. Or we could say it offers the illusion of connection without the demands of commitment. 
and it's left us feeling lonelier than ever. And I know that it's, it, it's important for some of you to catch this. A lot of us are, are part of the church because we want to connect. You want to have some community. That's why you're here. The challenge is that we've accepted kind of a social media approach to even church and family and work and school, where we're trying to have these relationships, but we don't want to commit ourselves. And so we come and we get frustrated because we feel so lonely and we don't feel connected. And we think, well, there must be something wrong with the church, or there must be something wrong with my family, or there must be something wrong with these people around me, when in reality, what we're missing is commitment. Parents want their kids to have good Christian friends and have those close relationships, but other things take priority in the schedule, and they only come when there aren't other things going on, and we wonder why they don't really feel connected there. I can't tell you how many times I've watched people pull away from the relationships and potential relationships in their lives, whether it's here at church uh, or other churches I've been in or with family or other places, and then they complain that they don't feel part of things and they just quit because they blame it on the family or the church or whatever. And it's even harder now because we're limited in the events we can have. And I get that, even at the church. And it's even more reason to take advantage of the things we are able to do. Find a way to make a connection with family in a way that you can and commit to doing it regularly. See, until we're willing to put ourselves in a position where we're willing to risk and we're willing to commit to the church, to the family, to friends, the feeling of community isn't going to be there. And what Paul is doing here is he's using affectionate, emotional language to put himself out there and show them his commitment to them. Because the only way community happens is when we're willing to commit to one another. And Paul uses a word here that kind of seems out of place here because it's a family word. He says to the church there, we were orphaned from you. He says, we're like family. And when we're separated from you, it feels like we're orphaned, that we lost our family. And that's why the terms brother and sister are used so much in this letter, because he's reiterating the family aspect of the church. There was an article online a couple of years ago, and it was about this lady, Hillary, and her husband, Lance, from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and how they met their new neighbors. Hillary had been adopted as a newborn, and she had always wondered about her biological family, but she didn't know much about them. And when she was getting ready to start her own family, she made a request for the adoption records to be unsealed. The request was granted, and Hillary learned, among other things, that she had a sister named Dawn Johnson, and Dawn was from a nearby town called Greenwood. And that's about all she could find out. Well, fast forward a year, they have new neighbors moving in. Hillary and her husband met them, but there was nothing unusual. One day later, roofers came to Dawn's house, uh, and dropped off a load of shingles. And the banner across the stack said, Johnson. And Hillary breathlessly runs over. She grabs the adoption paperwork and she said to her husband, I think our next door neighbor is my biological sister. And so these two sisters have been making up for lost time. It was a 19 year age difference between them, but they're spending a lot of time together. And I love what Hillary said about the relationships. She said, the moment when I first embraced her in the driveway, it was amazing. And here's what she said. I never knew I even wanted a sister. Never knew I wanted a sister until I had one. And I've read that story and a, a thought seems familiar to me. There's just something about it that, that you know, I kind of recognize and, and you know, you're not sure where at first because that's kind of a completely once in a lifetime type story. So why would it seem familiar? And then I realized it seems familiar because that's what happens here a lot. That's sure what happens in churches that people discover. They have brothers and sisters they never even knew they wanted to begin with. Like if you would have asked them, they would have thought, no, I don't want that. I don't necessarily need that. I'm good. Uh, frankly, I, you know, I'm not sure about all those people. And then they find out, oh, this is my brother. This is my sister in Christ. And that common commitment to Jesus binds them together. And it's amazing if they find they have a brother and sister they never even knew they really wanted, but they desperately needed. So Paul goes on to explain what it looks like to be committed to one another this way. 
In verse 17, he talks about the intense longing he has to see them and how he's tried to get to them. And if you want to know if you're committed to someone, this is a good place to start. Is there an intense longing, an intentional effort to be together? In fact, you could say the proof of commitment is showing up. The proof of commitment a lot of times is just showing up. Many of you remember Bill Lane, who was a member here for a long time. Bill had MS, and it was an effort for him just to get up and get around. But he was going to be here at church if there was strength in his body to do it because he loved being here. He loved his brothers and sisters in Christ, and he wanted to be with them. And I remember telling him, and I've told others here who, who have had to make a real effort to get here, how much I appreciate that commitment. Because it would be no effort at all for me. I mean, I'm healthy, I have transportation, I only live five minutes away. It doesn't take an effort for me to be here. But I know that for some of you, uh, it's hard work. And it has been over the years, but you love this church and God's people, and you're committed to being part of it in every way you can. And sometimes the proof of commitment is just showing up. And so Paul wants the people at the church in Thessalonica to know that he's done everything he can to get there. Verse 18 says, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. He wanted them to know that he did everything in his power to get to them because that effort shows your commitment. And I think the best example of this is Jesus showing up here on earth, stepping down from heaven and showing up to have a relationship with us. And he says, here's how much I'm willing to sacrifice to be with you. When you're willing to make some sacrifices to be together, that's commitment. And for some of you, you, you may want this, but you just don't feel it. You understand it's important, but you just don't feel it. And I would encourage you to do what Paul does. You can read it at home, but in chapter 3, Paul just prays for the people. He says, night and day I prayed. So start doing that. Your heart will follow your prayers. You start praying for people, and you'll start caring for them even more. Paul says, I wanted to be with you, but the problem, he says, is that Satan blocked their way. And it shows us that commitment to others is always going to be targeted by the enemy. That's Satan, and he destroys community by undermining commitment. Like a lion that preys on a gazelle, Satan knows that his best chance of picking off one of us is by separating us from the others, because we're stronger together. So he targets you when you're by yourself, and that's when you're most vulnerable. When you're not with other people who are following Jesus and sharing that common commitment, that's when you're most vulnerable. You can't follow Jesus when you're surrounded by people going in a different direction. So maybe for some of you, you need to spend more time with different people. It doesn't mean that you write off the ones you're spending time with now. It just means you recognize that you need brothers and sisters in Christ to walk with, or this isn't going to work. Because if you're separated and alone, the enemy is going to target you. And that's why Jesus prayed in John 17 when he was in the garden before he was arrested. He prayed that the church would be unified. Our commitment to each other has to be greater than our personal preferences. It has to be greater than our political affiliation. It has to be greater than our fashion choices. It has to be greater than the teams we cheer for. Our love for one another as brothers and sisters should override our non-essential opinions and preferences. And they can do their thing, and I'm just happy to be riding along with them. We have people here who root for teams that, that, that hate each other, but we have a common commitment that's stronger than that, as much as we joke about our rivalries. And so Paul goes on further to affirm his love. He says, For what is our hope, our joy, the crown in which our glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So here's the question. What's your joy? What's your glory? When Jesus returns and you stand before him, what's going to matter? I was at a conference in Phoenix several years back, and Don Wilson, the preacher at the host church, said that his son got a full scholarship to play soccer in college. But they turned it down because it was going to mean he wouldn't be able to be involved in the ministries at church that he was deeply involved in. And he said, when he stands before God, it isn't going to matter how many goals he scored. It isn't going to matter how many games he won. That's not what's going to matter. So what's going to be your hope? 
What are you going to put your hope in? Is it going to be your portfolio? Is it your joy? Is your joy going to be your professional accomplishments or how far you've climbed up the corporate ladder? Is your crown going to be the house you live in or the car that you drive? What will be your hope and crown? Well, it has a face. Your hope is a person. It's Jesus. But it's not just Jesus, it's each other. And so in this culture where there's an increasing amount of loneliness, where people want connection without commitment, we're going to do things differently. We're not going to live that way. We're going to put ourselves on the line and commit ourselves to each other. We're going to sacrifice for one another. We're going to make an intentional effort to gather together when we possibly can. And we're going to be a family, brothers and sisters. And one day, when we stand before Jesus, we'll be each other's hope and joy and crown. that you can't have community without commitment. Just connecting with people remotely doesn't develop real community, real relationships. That's why Jesus came to earth, so that he could have a relationship with us. He stepped down from heaven and became human so that he could have a real relationship with us. That took incredible commitment, just to leave heaven and live on earth. But he took it even further. He sacrificed himself for us so that we wouldn't have to bear the punishment for our sins. And when we take communion, that's what we thank God for. The forgiveness and the relationship we can have with him because of Christ. Because he was willing to commit himself to us in an amazing way. Scripture says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take of the bread together.
goes on and says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together. Let's pray. Father, your commitment to us is amazing. Not only were you willing to come to earth and live among us and sacrifice yourself for us, but you're still concerned with our needs, and we're grateful for that. And as we remember the commitment and sacrifice that Jesus made for us, I pray that you would, be, you would help us to overflow with love and commitment for the people around us. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today, and I pray that you have a great and safe week. God bless.